The miracles, we just had five babies on the stage and no emergencies. <laughs> yeah. Just before I get into uh, the message this morning, I did want to bring everyone up to speed on a couple of transitions that will be taking place at Calvary, and it has to do with a couple staff members. These transitions are actually down the road. They're going to be later this summer, but I did want you to be aware of them uh, now. One is uh, Stephen Nichols, who served as our youth pastor for six years now, is going to be uh, transitioning to uh, a different portfolio, uh, staying with Calvary, and he's going to be taking on some more responsibility with adult discipleship. And so uh, he's going to be making that transition this summer. And then our young adult, uh, a pastor who is uh, John Abarca, he will be uh, transitioning out and actually he and Grace will be moving on from Calvary. Uh, both of these guys have done such a phenomenal job for the last uh, six years. Uh, can we just say uh, an appreciation for that? Yeah. And uh, they're not leaving right away. If you're wondering why we're not bringing them up and praying over them, uh, they still have work to do. So, <laughs> so, but the idea is, is that we wanted you to be aware so that you can pray. Um, these are really significant ministries in our church family. And so uh, we'll be opening the posting for those uh, positions in about two weeks. And uh, so if you, uh, if you could leave, keep that in prayer, uh, that would help us a lot. Uh, we're in Matthew. This is actually the 24th week we've been in the Gospel of Matthew. We're uh, up to chapter 15 now, and we're going to begin in verse 21. And I have to tell you on the front end, this is one of those passages of Scripture that just make a lot of people uncomfortable. We don't like what Jesus doesn't say, and we don't like what he does say in this passage. It says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. <laughs> really challenging passage. Let's see how we do today. Um, is your faith dependent on your experience? Or another way to say it is this, do you have to get what you want in order to believe? Is that how faith works in our lives? Um, this passage actually is less about the miracle that Jesus performs and about the flexibility that Jesus demonstrates. And this is kind of unusual for us. And it, it helps us see a tension that he was actually working through in the moment. The first thing I want us to notice is that we can be surprised by the places that Jesus is willing to go. It says that he left the previous place, and if you remember from last week, he had been in a confrontation with some specific religious leaders who had traveled all the way from Jerusalem to kind of put him to the test. And if you really want to do an interesting study someday, you can go through the Gospels and see all the times and places that Jesus stepped away from where the conversation was and went to do something else. All the times that he withdraws, it's really interesting. But what he does is he withdraws and he goes to Tyre and Sidon. And Tyre and Sidon basically had the reput reputation of, of Las Vegas. So if, whatever, whatever happens in Tyre and Sidon stays in Tyre and Sidon. And it had a significant Gentile population. And so we're introduced, as he goes into this area, to a Canaanite woman. And this is really interesting, too, because uh, there was a long history 
ancient uh, interactions between Israel and the Canaanites and some of the atrocities that had been committed by the Canaanites against Israel had left some very uh, socially awkward realities even up to that day. There were these kind of uh, cultural apprehensions that existed. And this woman comes up to him and she's crying out. This is not a polite introduction. This is not a, a discreet interruption. This is not just a tap on the shoulder. She's making a lot of noise. And she uses one word and one phrase that's really important. She says the word Lord. So she's recognizing him as something even more than just a teacher or a prophet. And she also uses the phrase son of David, which is a Jewish phrase. And it's a mess messianic term, which means she's had some exposure at some point to understand who the Messiah would be and how he would be referred to. And last week, we just looked at some religious leaders who couldn't accept any of that, of that about Jesus. And this week, what we're seeing is there's a pagan woman who accepts all of that about Jesus. And she says, have mercy on me. Now, what's really interesting is she's not the one who is actually in great need. It's her daughter. Her daughter is suffering unbelievably as a result of a tormenting and evil spirit. But if you're a parent, you know that when your kids suffer, you suffer too, right? And even though her daughter seems to be possessed by this very dark spirit, what is also true is that she is still her daughter. And that matters to her. And so the daughter is also not present in this story. We don't have her here. So whatever's going to happen, it's going to be kind of a third party uh, interaction. And uh, so we can be surprised by where Jesus goes. We can also be surprised by what Jesus says and what he doesn't say. And in the 23rd verse, it says, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and they said, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. Jesus doesn't respond. He's completely silent. Just think about it. Have you ever felt that way when you have cried out to God? You don't sense any response back. And uh, what's happened is Jesus' ability to bring relief to sickness and disease and to bring freedom to people who are bound has caused a lot of people who've heard about him to move towards him. And it's created a number of challenges for him. He attracts people that often distract us. And so this woman comes to Jesus and the disciples have a response and their response is to get rid of her. They come to Jesus and they tell Jesus, you get rid of her. Why? They're making her, they're making them, she is making them uncomfortable, right? She's, she's yelling. She's crying out. This is a socially awkward situation. It's embarrassing. They don't know what to do. Jesus doesn't seem to be saying anything. So their only, their only option, as far as they can see, is to get rid of her because the, what's more important to them is that they have some peace and quiet and some calm than a person has their need met. And so they are telling Jesus, uh, to get rid of her. Have you noticed how often the, the disciples come off as not looking very good in the Gospels? And they wrote them. <laughs> like they're so honest. Of, they, they're so honest about themselves. And, and Jesus speaks, but this is what's interesting. It doesn't say that he said this to her, and it doesn't say that he said this to his disciples. He's, he's talking, but we're not sure to who. And, and what he says is, is uh, in, in verse 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, this is interesting. Jesus has been asked for two things. One is for help, for mercy, and the other is to get rid of her. He's, he's positioned between these two things. And his, his response isn't about either one. It's about his mission. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So why is Jesus responding like this? And I think it's because he's actually in Gentile territory. There's a large Gentile population and he understands what his mission is. And his mission is actually the redemption of the whole world, but it also comes with a strategy. And that is that you start with Israel and then it works out from there. And, and we understand this concept, right? We, we get this. In any rescue effort, you can't rescue everyone 
all at once, but you do have a strategy. There's, there's a target focus. You begin there and then it works out from there until everyone is rescued. Uh, back in, in ancient days, if you were on a, a ship and it was going to go down, they would take the lifeboats. And, and does anybody know who they would put on the lifeboats first? <laughs> Women and children, that's right. And, and then uh, when, when, they, when they were all taken care of, if there was still space, the men would go on and, and the captain was supposed to what? Go down with the ship. <laughs> yeah, not so good day for the captain. But the idea is they had a priority. Even if you were to get on a plane today, let's imagine you're getting on a plane and going someplace where there's palm trees and you need sunscreen, okay? And uh, so what do they tell you before the flight leaves? In the event of an emergency and the oxygen mask drop from the, 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 the ceiling, uh, what you're supposed to do is put your own mask on first before you take care of someone who's dependent on you. Why do they say that? Because if you pass out, you can't help anybody. And so Jesus understands the priority of mission. And the priority of mission is that, he's, that God is going to work his redemption through Israel, not around Israel but it's going to affect everyone. And so we're surprised by where Jesus goes. We're surprised by what he says and doesn't say. We're surprised by the flexibility of Jesus. James, Jesus seems to be speaking between these two things, these two requests, a woman and his disciples. And, and he's reminding himself of his passion for the lost. We can see that. I am sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But the original plan was to start there and, and move out from there. Now, what we're going to see is Jesus demonstrates some flexibility. And maybe that makes you uncomfortable, but this is not the only place this happens. If you know the story from John's uh, Gospel, chapter 2, Jesus and his disciples, even though he hasn't launched his ministry yet, shows up at a, a, at a wedding. And at the wedding, there's a young couple who are, are getting married. And back in those days, they didn't just have a reception after the ceremony. That reception lasted several days. And people would gather and they would eat. And, and evidently, there had been inadequate preparation. And the result was is that they were running out of wine. And, and Jesus' mother, Mary, goes to Jesus and says, they're running out of wine. And Jesus' response to her is, woman, what does that have to do? do with me this is not my hour now how many know anybody who starts a conversation with their mother saying woman <laughs> not good this is not a way to start a conversation and he says it's not yet my time what is he saying we're unclear exactly, but it seems as though this wasn't supposed to be the first miracle Jesus ever did. Or if this was a miracle he wasn't going to do, he was going to do, this wasn't the place that that miracle was going to take place. And, and Mary, what does she say? By the way, this is the last quote we have from Mary in the entire Bible. The last words of Mary that are recorded in Scripture. She goes to the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And she walks off the stage. And Jesus looks at the servants and he says, go and fill up the six stone jars. And these are not small things. Uh, these stone jars held 20 to 30 gallons apiece. And he says, go fill them up with water. And so they do that and they kept, they kept pouring in until they're all full. And then he tells the servants, he says, draw out some of that water and take it to the master of the banquet, which they do. And when the master of the banquet tastes it, what he finds out is that it is wine and it is the best wine that he has ever had in his life. What was Jesus doing? Nobody was going to die. But there was going to be a socially awkward, embarrassing situation that could be attached to the memory of this couple for the rest of their lives. Oh yeah, that's Bob and Sue, the people who ran out of wine. <laughs> kind of like that. And Jesus shows flexibility. Uh, there are some people who think that God has written everything and carved everything out in stone and he's only going to do what he's already decided to do and he never deviates from his plan and that can make God seem a little bit harsh and a little bit uncaring. But how many are glad we actually have a Savior who hears you when you cry and he can make a change in his plans if it's going to help us. Amen? Yeah. So maybe that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. 
But that's what we see in this passage. And so what Jesus is doing here is he's actually trying to seek his Father's will in the midst of this, because this is what is most important to Jesus always. In fact, he would tell us in one of the Gospels, he would say, I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what I see my Father do. Obedience to his Father was most important. So then it says, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, the woman heard the words of Jesus, even if he wasn't speaking directly to her. But she also sees the heart of Jesus. And this is really important. Faith hears words, but faith also sees the heart of Jesus. And Jesus didn't say no. Jesus didn't deny anything. Jesus didn't close the door because faith believes that Jesus is good, even if circumstances are not. And so she doesn't understand why he's talking about his mission now, but he didn't say no. And so she just keeps coming back to him and she keeps crying out to him. And what, she, what I think she's trying to say is this, I can sense that something is troubling you, but there's also something troubling me. And then uh, 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 this woman has no options. There's nobody else that can help. There's nobody else that can heal her daughter. She's absolutely desperate. And, and Jesus, wh why would he be concerned? It is entirely possible that if he, he begins ministry in the Gentile region and to a Gentile, that what will happen is his ministry could get hijacked. That the incredible need of that region would now become the primary focus and he wouldn't be able to escape just the gravitational pull of so much need. We, we are unsure what he's facing down and going through. But the next thing that Jesus says is really hard for us to hear. There's, there's no way, really nice way to put a spin on this. He says, uh, it is not right to take children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, I can't imagine a situation where being called a dog is actually complimentary. It's just not a compliment. <laughs> so he's made two statements to start with. First of all, I have not been sent. And then second, it is not right. Jesus seems to be trying to find his way through two things. He's seeking his Father's will. He knows God loves the Gentiles, but he knows what the original plan is, and that's Israel and then outward. Now, what's interesting, and I found this in a number of, of commentaries, is that the term Jesus uses for dog is not a wild dog. That's a different word. He uses the term house dog. Let's just check. How many have a, a dog in your house? And for some of you, like, they're, they're like family. Uh, we, we have, we, we've had dogs, and the dog that I have now uh, was given to me on, on Father's Day uh, 13 years ago. Uh, it, it's the dog my family always wanted. And when they give it to you on Father's Day, what can you say? <laughs> I had no options. And uh, so... So we, we have this concept of house dogs. We were, we were going away on vacation, and so I was going to kennel our dog. And, and one of the ladies in the church, when she heard I was kenneling the dog, she came to me, and she was horrified. She said, how can you put your dog in a place like that? She said, you should give me your dog, and I'll take care of your dog, because that's a horrible place. I said, no, no, no. It's a very nice place. It's more like a pet resort. And she said, have you been back to see what that looks like? I said, no, the maitre d' won't let me pass the, the door. <laughs> kind of like that. It's, it's a house dog. It's, it's a pet. And while the term dog is not a compliment, that, that dog is in the house. And what this here, woman hears is, I may be a Gentile, but I'm not outside of the house. She wasn't looking for reasons to leave. She was looking for any open door at all. And what she heard was, I'm in the house. And Jesus has said, it's not right. And her response is, yes, it is, Lord. Even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. How many of your dogs know where to sit? 
when the sloppiest eaters are eating, like they go right there and, and the dogs get the crumbs. And what this woman is doing is she's holding on to Jesus for life. There's no one else that can help her. There's no one else that can heal her daughter. The words of Jesus sometimes do offend us, but one of the questions we really have to ask ourselves is will we only believe in Jesus as long as he never says anything that offends us? Can we only tolerate Jesus as long as he thinks like us and acts like us? And if that's true, I'm wondering in that scenario who the real God is. Something we should think about. And she just responds, did you hear what you said? I'm in the house. And then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith, tremendous faith. Your request is granted. And that daughter was healed at that moment. Then Jesus said, this is the turning point in the story. And now he's going to respond. And in this response, he says to her, you can argue in a way this woman showed Jesus grace even when she could have interpreted the conversation as harsh to her. And grace is Jesus' native language. And his response to her is remarkable. She didn't run away. And Jesus now sees what the Father's will is, and he heals her daughter. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. So what made the difference? What made the difference in this story? What made the difference to this daughter? What made a difference uh, uh, in this situation? And it's, it's because she believed something. She believed that the heart of Jesus was good even when she didn't understand the words. And this is important. Faith doesn't just hear the words of Jesus and believe in the power of Jesus. It also trusts the heart of Jesus. We've heard his words. We've seen evidence of his power. But do you trust his heart for you? Now, the disciples were not very encouraging. And sometimes that's still true. There are people who can be as distracting to Jesus as attracting to Jesus, even though they claim to follow Jesus. But our faith is not in Jesus' followers. Our faith is in Jesus. That's important to remember. And here's the last point I want to make this morning, and that is faith in Jesus winds up helping others. Because of her faith in Jesus in that moment, because she trusted his, his heart, her daughter is going to be completely free. And she's going to be made whole. And whatever nightmare, however long that had existed, that nightmare ended on that day. So let me ask you a question this morning. Whose suffering breaks your heart? It might be someone who's sitting right next to you. It might be someone in your house. It might be someone that you're related to or care a lot about, but there's someone in your life that what they're going through breaks your heart. And so this morning, I'm going to ask that if you are one of those people who have someone in your life that's really going through something and you would like to see God make a difference in their life, we're going to exercise faith today. So if you're here and there's someone in your life who is suffering and you want something, God to do something about it, would you just stand to your feet anywhere in the room? I promise I won't embarrass you, but we're gonna have you stand. Yeah. So I have good news for you. I have very good news for you. And that is that even if Jesus seems silent and even if you don't understand his words, you can trust his heart. And right now he is seeing your faith and I've got good news for you. You are in the house today. Even if that other person isn't here right now, you are in the house today and Jesus is about to do something for you. So everyone else who are seated, if you could just stand and I'd like you to extend your hands towards someone who's already standing and let's lift each and every one of these situations up in prayer. That God would do something miraculous today. Heavenly Father, would you please reach through right now. Let your 
let the faith of those standing capture your attention and let your word be spoken to each and every situation today that there is healing there is freedom there is provision that is coming to every single person who who we are representing today and we ask that in the strong name of your son Jesus because we hear his words and we see his power but we also know his heart in Jesus name amen